Our first objective, then, was to merge all the beachheads into one and 50 miles of men drive on together beyond the red sands through the broken wall. Where I was, it wasn't too bad getting ashore. After that it started, we had to fight for every bloody field. It was the same each time, you crawl on your belly, keeping your backside down like you'd been told, chuck in a few hand grenades, then rush them. Sometimes they killed us, but we were killing more of them. The trickiest part was the farms. They were regular little jerry fortresses. If we couldn't manage them on our own, then we'd have to wait while the company commander called back for artillery support. The Navy was still with us too, chucking in shells ahead of us. In three days we advanced seven miles. Then we were told to stand fast and dig in. Next morning we heard the news. We got it from the BBC. It sounded great. We'd joined up all along the bridgehead. There was a solid line, 45 miles of it. We'd got a foothold. We were in. We didn't have to do much navigating to get there. You just followed the convoys. I was doing close support. We waited around and then the ground troops would whistle us out and told us about some hun target they wanted removed and then in we'd go. We were like taxis on a cab ring. There's something nice about a beach, any beach. You think of a beach and chances are you'll remember something nice. Like a party or a picnic. Pals from the old days. Girls in bathing suits. But the one I worked, Utah, looked more like a freight yard once we got going. For quite a while, we brought more supplies right over the open beach. Like we'd practiced it and like we'd made up as we went along. We worked a 24-hour shift. With ducks, lights, rafts, rowboats, all sorts of Rube Goldbergs. The stuff just kept pouring in. Tanks, trucks, food, ammo, guys. Millions of things. We didn't think we'd spend 15 days in the same field outside Colm. With the wood behind us and the Germans in another wood half a mile in front of us. And a little empty valley in between. Each side mortaring each other all the time. Just men you had to live in a slit trench. And you got into a routine. You know, stand through from half past four to half past five. And two hours wait for breakfast. Came up fairly hot in bacon or sausage, tea, and of course, biscuits. We've been living on compo food since D-Day. It was good food, but, well, you know, you got tired of it. I'd have given a lot for a slice of fresh bread and butter or a cup of fresh tea. Fifteen days is a long time to stay in one place and be mortared. Yet so you think everyone's coming straight for you. every case we ever had, especially the first one. The ambulance brought him in late one afternoon. I came over to where he was lying and he looked up and grinned. I asked him how he felt. He said something about the, the German with a machine pistol using him for a dartboard. He was quiet and patient and a little bewildered. He'd never been hurt before. He asked how the fighting was going and then he passed out. The doctor came over and looked at his wounds and then swore. Said he had no business to be alive. We put him on the operating table and did what we could. The doctor kept swearing all the time he was operating. We couldn't stop the bleeding. I remember the radio news that night. They said the casualties had been surprisingly light.
They said the whole thing was dear old Winston's idea. A collapsible prefabricated harbour with everything on it except a naffy. Well, I wouldn't put it past him, it's sort of idea he would have. Worked in the end. Mulberry, they called it. Well, I felt pretty good about it because I'd watched it grow right from the sinking of the first ships for the outer breakwater. And further along to the west, the Yanks had brought one over too. Then on D plus uh, 13, I think it was, an onshore wind started up. Not much at first, but it got worse. And unloading onto the open beaches got very tricky. We heard that over on the Yank section, the other harbour had been put right out of action. And when the wind dropped, old Mulberry looked pretty sick. And up to that time, it was the only bleeding harbour we had. <laughs>